This conference yeah, will now be recorded. Oh, there we go. And this this uh, is going to be about the improvements that we've um, we've worked on to Lineside Asset Foundations. In in the first instance, it's about location cases, but um, it's open to interpretation, and I'll and I'll show you exactly what I what I mean. Um, so it says NAL here, but it's it, the little words underneath the CRH company. So I I work for my big parent company is CRH, Cuba Systems and NAL are sister companies and the integration between us is um, is what this is about as well. It's about the um, the working relationship that we have together and also about the workshop that we, we created and how we came about to make this. So I'll, I'll move on here slightly. So the IPG is the uh, the infrastructure project uh, products group. That's what we fall under. So NAL, Cubis and, and Phyloform, that's how we, we sort of operate underneath CRH. And I'll, um, Cubis, you may know us for UTXs, for multi-duct and for platform chambers, and, and that's primarily the business I look after. This is the National Infrastructure Centre. So this is where NAL's uh, headquarters are, and they have all of their, their products and our products outside in real life in a street, ski, ska, um, sorry, street scene or in a railscape. And um, once this is all over, we're you know, more than happy to have you up there. And we do these demo days, which turn into workshops. And if you can see in the, in the background on the left-hand picture, we have a wigwag and we have a location cabinet base uh, case at the back there. And that's what we're gonna be talking about is the, is the cases and how they fit in the ground. But these are the, um, the ideal hotspots. And what we did is we had a group of people from Network Rail and from other contractors as well. And they saw the benefits and they saw it, um, how it could translate from what we already do in traffic signals, highways and EV and how it could work for the rail. And we've, we've made a workshop and we've done IDCs and we've, and we've got it all the way through now to, um, I'm just doing the, the form two, three for various projects uh, to make it like a, a non-specific couple of forms as well. So we, we've gone all the way through it together, working together, um, which is which is how it should be done really. And that's how NAL and Cubis work together. So we identify initial problems uh, and we try and find out what the people, the users, the operatives are actually struggling with, the maintainers and you know the people who are putting the cables in as well, not just the civils teams. Um, R&D, so we do that together. So the person who's going to be um, the end client or the person who's going to be using it is brought through the process and, and really and truly it's about making the right steps together and then having something that's fruitful at the end of it that's going to be um, bringing efficiency, safety and of course sustainability as we go along. So trying to find the, the best way of doing it and then the solution that comes up. And what we have is um, a problem that's found in every sector is is these is is, is cabled cabinets is, is a way of getting into them. Basically, none of them are fit for digital usage or a 21st century um, way of thinking. They have really poor access into the bottom of them or working access to get cables into. There are a number of problems around those as well, um, and also, of course, that they're just um, unwieldy sort of pieces of kit and concrete that you have to lump about on the side of the track in our in our case. So we address some of the problems here and and then I'll explain how we've um, overcome those and, and what it is that we've done to do so as well. So that's the sort of thing that we usually face with on the side of the track, a small suite with, with a hard standing area, trough butting up to the bottom of it and a couple of location cases, some, some handrail there as well. That's the sort of thing that we, we, we typically see. And the problems that we um, we know about and that we've discussed. I mean, in the first instance is that there's a huge amount of concrete there. Um, I've rounded it up slightly from about 237 kilos to it's, you know, it's roughly a quarter of a ton of concrete there of a, of a concrete jigsaw puzzle. The base piece weighing about 120 kilos in itself. And we know that most of these installations for say, let's say Port Talbot West Phase 2 that's coming up will be mainly rural that will have to have been dropped off in a shift beforehand by RRV. Um, Mechanical lifting equipment should be used for these, but we know in those sorts of instances it's going to be um, pushed into a hole or tried to be lifted with a group of four people or three people and, and, and moved into place. So safe systems of work and you know um, the risk assessments need to be looked at intensely in those sorts of situations. The overall depth is only 300 mil as well. So we're looking at um, restrictions on BEM radii, on working access, on actual physical space to put cables into as well. And we know that we've heard of um, horror stories where they've had to, um, people have, have come in through the sides or have had to come in up through the bottom of these and core through the, the concrete at the base and, and make use of it that way because it's just the only way that they could make the bends fit because of the, the congestion with the cables. 
individual trough connections as well so that's not just leading up to the, ca the cabinets but that's interacting between cabinets as well so that's very limited it's obviously um, a large amount of civils work it's another cost it's another amount of time that needs to be spent next to the track doing this um, and again you know you're, you're using either concrete or if you're using a lighter weight trough it's just another civils work but if you're if you're using concrete it's another addition um, towards a non-sustainable method of doing it um, and then when it comes to interacting between the cabinets I mean all of these are going to be these troughs are going to be full with loops of the same cable that they're going to be chock-a-block with um, a very hard to unpick jigsaw puzzle of or um, spaghetti junction of, of cables and it makes it terribly difficult when you're maintaining or removing life expired or having to replace cables um, it just makes life more difficult than it needs to be poor connection at the base we know that there are snagging contracts that happen because our friend expanding foam gets used quite heavily so that was something that needed to be addressed something that was purpose-built instead of it being an afterthought because you do the most beautiful installation and um, you come along and you have to foam it up and then it doesn't get cut off and, and people walk away from it so snagging was a big problem about you know all of this in itself and if we take that little picture there um, we'll look at the hard stand in its own uh, right later on but that for me you know the, the ground around it isn't too bad it's you, you could walk up to that it's a small trip hazard of, of, of timber um, and moving on to a, sl a slightly smaller aggregate that's better to work on um, but goes everywhere and an external earth pot as well so something like that is a, is a prime example of, of where we're going to be looking to to change it um, clay balls okay so they're to eliminate condensation and they get down the troughs they get in in and out the you know in the duct roots and they spill out onto the hard stand they're a nightmare to work with they get wet and need replacing and also they are perfect bedding media in the middle of nowhere in the warmest place possible in the cabinet for our friends vermin which are also another consideration that are hugely prevalent on the track um, as I said they're the typically the warmest place um, on the side of the track the most shelter so why would you not go there so mitigating them getting up into the belly of these cabinets is something that's imperative um, covers okay so when you're waiting for a cabinet as well to come um, and you may have done a, a wonderful installation but you then you then have to put a piece of ply on top of it and screw it in or bolt it in or we've seen you know pallets with a bag of cement on top of it or even as you see there just sort of makeshift covers that are trip hazards that could blow off and there's no you know there's no rating or anything on that there's it could be fixed down by any method and that could come off and, and go near the track in, in its worst case scenario um accepting of alternative sizes so this is more about future technologies and the way in which we're governed at, say 2050 when our cabinets put in last year or this year life expire uh, underneath it you're, you've either got a huge amount of civils work to do or you have um, just fit it back onto, the, you know, have the same size cabinet work to the exact same sizes that you've been working to for the last 30 years. So we don't believe that the future technology should be governed by concrete in the ground. So just four bolt holes um, shouldn't be telling you what you can put on top of it, especially as we move towards uh, the digital signaling age. Climate change is, is absolutely real, is, is happening places that weren't underwater five years ago are finding themselves with the, the rivers bursting their banks more often than they ever did before. So mitigation to this, not I don't know that you'll ever find a complete remedy, but mitigation at least to, to um, allow water to egress or to move these from an area of flood zone um, is, is necessary. But why change, I suppose, and across the, across the board, and this goes to other sectors as well, I mean, a drive for safer, quicker, cost-effective sustainable solutions I mean that's the the, the drive for us as a, as a company um, it's also the drive for, for network rail looking at project speed of course is is probably the the buzzword one that comes to mind as you as you look across uh, the media coming out of coronavirus but um, SQL as well is something that we work alongside quite heavily and we value engineer projects when it comes to our other sort of pro uh, products such as chambers and, and looking at BEM radii and, uh, and making them as small as humanly possible but measuring upon and improving the carbon outputs of a, of a project so what I'll show you next this is what we've come up with and that's what it looks like up at the head office and I'll talk about it more now but we know uh, using the rail carbon tool and okay there's going to be some approximations there that each one of these two cabinet bases will reduce the carbon output um, by 445 kilos in comparison to a two location cabinet base uh, with traditional methods um, so for a single cabinet because we do these in multiples as you'll see 
um, a single one, we, we can estimate it at being a 200 kilogram carbon reduction against the standard. Not, not, not a tiny amount at all, especially when you look at the huge resigling project. So this is, this is what we've come up with in conjunction with Network Rail, looking at all of the factors that could be tweaked, that could be changed from what we've done in other sectors. Um, and it's an innovative cabinet base for single or multiple rail cabinet sites. Appreciate that you've only seen the, the two cabinet base, but we do these for singles um, all the way up to sixes at the moment. Um, and my emphasis really is on, uh, on the one and two cabinets because they're the most prevalent. It's made up of a few parts that may be familiar to you, some of them. Um, the Ultima Connect Access Chamber, which is a, a Cubist product that is F900 vertically rated, is over five tonne uh, square metre of sidewall loading as well. But this one is modular, so it means that it can be built into whatever size you need it to be. Within 100 mil of any clear opening, we can do that. So whilst we go through this, please, I'd like you to think about other problems that you may see. We're looking at loco DR as well. We're looking at DNO cabinets, and I'll show you an example of that at the end, but points heating transformers and disconnection boxes. Everything that could be a line side asset that is founded on a piece of concrete can be founded on one of these that is much easier to put in and much quicker with a sustainable outcome. And that's what we're trying to do is, is promote the the through the, the, um, the work bank, the way that we came to this, the way that we um, have implemented the changes and also the changes that can be implemented as we as we move on into other parts of the track. Um, the cabinet modules, which you can't see too clearly there, but they I will show you them in more detail. But these are uh, the parts that the cabinet will sit on and then this will in turn be fixed to the chamber underneath as well. And we have the gland tray modules which will allow safe passage of, of cables through, but also when we look at the vermin uh, reduction, they're made of aluminium as well, and the grommets and glands that we supply uh, configured in such a way that they don't get bitten through, so that it does provide a physical barrier as well. But also when we look at plug and play, if we can, um, it's, it's quite contentious, but whether or not we get that in the rail, um, this is a small upgrade of about 30 pounds or something, and you'll be fit and ready for, for plug and play systems. Um, cover and frame modules, and just to say that the cover and frame modules and the cabinet modules that you see all linked together there are all made of aluminium. They're all powder coated as well in case of saline corrosion, um, but we kept them as aluminium to reduce the weight, but keep the strength. And if you can just see at the back here, these have, have uh, down risers as well. So they're all fixed together onto the chamber, but they're also all bolted together as well. And I'll show you some more photos and images of that as well. So it's all one superstructure. And then we have the cable trough connector as well at the bottom. And just to mention these uh, these covers, they're GRP, anti-slip, one and a half ton rated. And we've got these bearer bars in the middle that are completely removable. So we will talk about these more. Um, but when I said to keep an eye on the hard stand area, I'll spoiler alert, what we're trying to do is um, remove the need for the timber edged hard stand as we have it inbuilt within this. So we have these hard standing areas so you have safe working access to either side um, but you also have all of that room underneath the chamber underneath the cabinets to be able to have the free movement to be able to cable these up um, this is what it looked like in its first iteration where we didn't have the sides if you see there we've got the, the covers at the ends here on this render we didn't and I'm, I'm working on getting them getting them busy in the CAD department I've got a couple of pictures where it looks a bit better but this is a three cabinet base um, what we're trying to do is simplify the installation process, get it right down on time, right down on the sustainability side of it as well, remove as much concrete as we can um, and make life a lot easier for everybody in that process as well. So what we've got, instead of it being 250 kilos, most of the time if these are going to be in rural areas, they'd be delivered by an RRV like the, the week before and we can have them delivered flat packs such as this and I'll show you better pictures. This is just to show you what the Ultima Connect looks like. Um, we've got hockey sticks, which are the bends on the left, and we have straights, and that's all it is. It's made up of different sizes of these, and they get knocked together with these GRP pegs. And if anybody knows our Ultima chambers, uh, how robust they are, they're GRP. Um, this is even stronger than our standard Ultima because we've had to beef up the uh, connection points. So um, 17 kg maximum weight, and the maximum weight is coming from these uh, cabinet modules, as you see here. This was from our Swindon trial, and I'll show you the video installation of it shortly as well. But we're looking to remove the need for mechanical lifting completely. The two cabinet base, all of this was delivered in the back of the black van that you can see in the background. Uh, just a small Mercedes sort of sprinter type van. Everything was there for, for that uh, from, a, from a material point of view, barring the aggregate, of course. Um, no requirement for concrete on site. So we're looking at an MOT backfill. I have standard detailed drawings for all of these um, with designer risk assessments built into them as well. 
Um, and also, and I'll, I'll show you at the end um, a little slide on it, but we've, we've done the wind calculations, overturn moments, ground bearing capacity. Um, we've done the full um, sweep of checks on this as well. But uh, facilitating all of the cable bend radius was one of the ones, wasn't it? So we had the weight, we had the issues along the height, which gave problems when it came to cable bend radius. If you look at the next slide, I think that's a better way of doing it, where you interact with all of the chambers, with all of the cabinets, sorry, underneath there, where you've got that safe working access, you take the covers off and you've got all of the access underneath, you put them back on and you can work safely on top of it anyway. But that in itself will reduce the amount of uh, time on site, the confusion or, you know, it's a wet night, it's Tuesday night in Derby and it's two in the morning, you need to get it done. If you can see what you're doing properly instead of throwing your arm through a trough, it's got to be a better situation. And when we mention trough, we're not looking at having a trough up to each and every cabinet. We're looking at having maybe one or two centralized troughs that could spread the power or the, or the feed into each and every one of those cabinets instead of having um, a huge amount of them. And that would again reduce the amount of um, time on the side of the track and civil's work required. So one trough, as I, as I sort of mentioned, that picture there gives a nice little image of it with a half cover because we did it in two halves for manual handling reasons to keep it light, but also so that you could sit in there if you need or sit on top of it with your legs in there and, and work on the cabinet or, or, you know, be pulling cables through. So you've got somewhere to actually do it um, where you're not on your hands and knees trying to drag a, a cable from underneath a, a cabinet and pull it through. Um, but alternatively, of course, you can take them all out or you can put them all back on. Um, when I said about flat pack, we will address it as well. But if some of you eagle-eyed people might have noticed that this one here has lifting eyes, so and it's all sort of strapped together. So um, we don't have to have them flat packed. You can have them fully built as well, and we'll just have them dropped off on the back of a, a, a lorry, and it just needs an excavation on site, and you, and you drop them in, and that's and that's it. Um, the positive trough connection, which you'll see how they cut that with a hand saw through the GRP, which is nice and easy. But we have these, and we'll have these for any size of trough that you need. This is just our trough, our GRP trough that we've got thousands of meters on HS2 at the moment. Um, we've got, we're going through the, the ringer at the moment with Network Rail for uh, approval. It's on trial um, with Network Rail at the moment. So um, when we looked at clay balls as well, so we've got rid of those. So we don't have the issues that you, you naturally have with those um, as, as a medium for vermin to uh, be attracted to. And of course, we've got the gland train between this cabinet module and the cabinet. So we've got in between these two is the gland tray, which will act as the physical deterrent to allow, stop vermin from coming up here. But what we have here, and it's proven in other industries and disciplines, is ventilation. So that stops, the, well, the free flow of air stops condensation from forming. And what it also does is it, if there are any buildup of ground gases, noxious gases, it will allow it to ventilate as well. So you've got no worries when lifting a cover off if there was ever gonna be um, some form of gases. Um, so there we go. I've just talked about that part of it with a, with a vermin side of it as well. But accommodation of new alternative cabinets. So we're looking at new technology can be placed on top of these. We've worked on obviously the half lokes, the full lokes, WTS cases, looking at local DR. But because we manufacture these interface plates, these modules, we can make the aperture, the bolt centers to whatever it is. And because the chamber underneath it can be made to within 100 mil of anything, any square opening. And we've done these in 12 meter by three meter chambers previously at London City Airport we have the confidence in being able to cite any sort of future technology on top of them, which we think is extremely important. And there we go. So that's the partially uh, built or completely flat packed in the top. And then at the bottom there showing you how we would deliver it to site with lifting eyes and, and fully built and, and dropped into place just on site. If you're looking at a depot or somewhere with a lot of machinery that you could just have to hand, um, if not probably best to put in the back of the van and take to work with you of the night. So purpose-built covers as well. So we've got the um, the covers there that go on top that negate the need for any ply or bags of cement or anything covering up the holes whilst you're waiting for your cabinets. And one of the snags that we picked up as we did this or one of the changes was uh, when we did this installation was you can see they're quite shiny. Um, we've now made them anti-slip and not shiny so that they're not slippy. Why make everything else anti-slip and then have something that's fairly um, probably dangerous if you, if you tread on it and it's wet. So we've, we've changed that. And also again, this part at the bottom we entertained an idea that um, another a contractor was mentioning about having safe when you stand off here. It would have been good to have something that made it, you know, completely level ground. And we worked out that obviously if you're going to be compacting all of this ground around it, that, that was more than adequate. And this did basically the same job as, as the compacted ballast. 
Um, when we're looking at mitigation of flood as well, the ideas that were coming up, you know, connecting it to trackside drainage, because we have trackside drainage chambers, that's one of my approved range of um, catch pits for, for Debra Rail. So we have the ability and the experience to be able to do so, and it would be a case of either drilling a hole in the side of the cabinet and linking it up to track drainage if, if applicable, um, or we can give details to be able to create a French drain or a sump base in the in the in the uh, in the void that we do on HS2. We do on other projects as well. Um, to egress of water is extremely important, so that that could help with that. But also within other sectors, we look at a plinth, and this just raises the cabinet out of that area. So there you go. On the right hand side, we have the loc on top of it as it normally would be in an area of flood risk. We can put it on a plinth that will raise it up. You still have the access underneath here and you have the access fully underneath either side of it. Um, and in other areas, we've supplied small stools and things that can be kept underneath here because we understand that too big a jump and you, you can't see the relays in the top shelves and things. So um, that is something that would be on a base by, on a case by case application. But that's something that we have obviously in the bank as well. And, and that's what the, the plug and play looks like. Uh, and that's something that we can supply because uh, the traffic signals game, which this is part of, went from a four day installation to a four hour installation when everything was done in a non-weather dependent environment. So something that I'm hoping that we move towards for the speed and the safety of people. Um, but again, it is quite contentious as to whether or not we'll do it. And it certainly won't look like that, I wouldn't imagine. So uh, we'll see what happens, watch the space. Uh, so the hard standing that we were talking about before, and, you've, and I've given the game away, but this is, you know, the, the traditional hard stand that seems to be fairly, um, it doesn't seem to make much sense to me if I'm totally honest. It increases the cabinet footprint. Obviously, there's a time and an expense to install, install it. More manual handling issues because you have to bring that to site and install it. You're spending more time in, uh, in an area of risk. Vegetation growth was a, was a new one on me, but they're, the people who put these and uh, maintain these said that they often spend more time devegetating these areas, de-weeding them, than they do actually doing the maintenance on the on the cabinet. So again, you're there for longer than you need to be, and there's a, there's a, an expense to that. Um, so what we're trying to do uh, is is eliminate these, and of course, look, the surrounding ground is usually ballast, and you may have walked 500 meters on on the slippiest sleepers or on the on the most um, awkward amount of of track ballast to be presented, like I said, with a small trip hazard of timber and some smaller aggregate. I mean, it doesn't make a, a huge amount of sense to me in, in, in all honesty. So we extended it out from that first iteration of a render that you saw to having the covers either side of it. And I will say, so 10, 50 mil, so we have that in the middle of the, um, in between these chambers, uh, in the cabinets, I keep calling them chambers, in between the cabinets. And um, with the extra 50 mil that we have on the edges here as well, it makes it, it does make it 1100 so i think he might have his measurement off there it makes it 1100 here so the doors don't smash together when they open as well so you'll have safe access between them the doors don't hit that's been taken into consideration as well and of course with the compacted ballast around it we hope to remove at least five square meters on a three cabinet excavation of, of work so hopefully with little additional it's just an extra couple of uh, just an extra couple of cover sizes either end when you're digging um so we're reducing everything, eliminating the vegetation was a big one for us because obviously dark, dank underneath those covers, it's not going to be particularly good to germinate uh, for um, any sort of plants and things. So we'll be able to minimize that massively. Um, we take away the maintenance time and, and the cost for that. But also when we look at removing that 700 milli, the side of it, we, we may be able to move this back slightly and uh, and look at removing some of the GRP fencing wherever possible as well. So that's the sort of um, ethos behind removing the hard stand area as well. And, and in doing so, it, it takes takes a lot of time off of the, the project, which is which is a wonderful one for program time. And I'll share with that uh, you with that in a minute. Um, all the components come in from the back of the van. This is the track installation that we did at Swindon at the electrification school down there, just to prove how long it, it went, you know, it took to go in. We did it by the traditional methods of, of earth mat and mark and I and building it back up again and just to see exactly how quick we believed that we would be uh, and make sure it added up everything was hand carried to the site so we you know nice and easy to to, to move it about on a site of a night time it's installed using hand tools uh, just a drill was the only uh, mechanical thing there at all and that was battery operated so having that hard stand massively reduces the the time that we're going to be spending on this so a two cabinet base 
this one here that we did went in in less than a shift and we started at nine in the morning, finished at three in the afternoon. And that was a two cabinet base done and dusted um, with a standard installation with the traditional methods. Two and a half shifts is, is a standard um, guideline for timeline of, of, of installation on these two and a half shifts. So we're looking at a shift and a half. Even if you gave that extra half a shift for any sort of problem that ever came up, um, I'd be conservative on that sometimes. But you know, even a shift to save on that is is insane. So that's what it looks like in its in its glory afterwards, as we've seen. And this is a small video of it as it went in, just to show you how easy it was, and just to point out some of the finer details of it on the interior faces as well that you may not have seen from the renders that we did. Um, just wanted to get it down as much as. Uh, Dig it down um, as, you, as you naturally would. Lightweight system, everything's in there. So there's all the, the modules and everything and just in the back of a van. And I mean, that would have been far too much to put in the back of a, a standard van if you were doing it in traditional methods uh, and just to rock up to site. Interesting though, in as much as we, we got the aggregate there, but everything that was put back in, because the training ground was MOT type one and road planings and recycled and it was compacted to within an inch of its life. Everything that went back in was was really good as Doug's material. So we were able to use that again. It's so the earthing and the marconite and then just backfilling, bringing it back up to uh, formation, having what we did that's different is we put pea shingle in here because obviously we're leveling something off here rather than just dropping it in the ground. So to have a little bit of play in it, to be able to measure it was, um, was good. So that was something that the the team there got used to quite well. You can see how quickly this goes together, just like a jigsaw, a bit of Lego. Cut it through with hand tools, in it goes, and then the rest of it is just bolting it in, and it's drilling holes and putting it in nice and lightweight, and it just fits together. Again, just like a little puzzle, goes together, and everything gets just bolted in. And it took, once they got to this point, it took two hours to do the whole cabinet base system, and this was the first time they'd ever seen it. And you can see the bolts just go in, um, if you can just about make out here, that's an earthing point. So each and every one of these frames has an earthing point in every corner so that you can have the earthing within the footprint instead of an external earth pot. And then everything could be linked together within here and earthed on the interior face. What we're looking to do is to have one of our gray covers um, to have a green sticker on it or to be green. And then whenever the person has done the earthing, whichever one they've linked it up to, you can just put that green cover or the one with the sticker over the earthing point or where it's where it's joined up so you don't have to lift every cover and you know every time you did that it guaranteed it would be the last cover you picked up so just a marker for that and then the covers go and you see the bearer bars there as well so nice and easy and we've changed it again as well not just the um uh, not just the cover parts but also the lifting guys we had we had a, a locking piece and a locking eye and a lifting eye separately we've integrated them into the same piece so the lifting eye is now the locking eye as well so you don't have two holes or something for a vermin to get into but yeah nice nice and easy to go in everybody who put it in and all of the team at network rail that were there at the time um thought it was brilliant so we're we're pushing on ahead and um we're now looking at um some of the bigger projects as well so we're, we're being earmarked for some of those and like i said i'm just working or finishing off my form two three for various on on a certain route and um and that should hopefully get put through and then it can be used anywhere on that route. And because this is a civil's asset, it doesn't need or cannot be put through product acceptance. So this is the only thing that all we've done is, is patented it. So we've got the IP on it um, is, is as good as being um, product accepted. So I just wanted to show you these these couple of pictures here, just to remind you after seeing that of all the working space and every all, all of the, the sort of free access that they had, just to remind you of how tight and congested it is on the interior face of a cabinet at the moment. And that's all the space that you've got to work with alongside one trough, maybe two troughs and uh, and the hard stand side on the, on the next picture with the external earth pots in which you could definitely walk along that. That's not bad ground to walk on. So it's um, things like that that we're trying to eradicate. But then again, to remind you that it's not just that disconnection boxes that use the same sort of uh, installation methods, points heating transformers where we could probably bring those all the way back in line with the cabinets if possible, or at least a bit further back onto the same footprint, maybe get rid of that GRP fencing as well, things like that. So when I'm talking about other projects and other um, instances, this look, may look fairly similar, but it's just a, another instance of things that we can do, like a DNO cabinet. When we looked at this, it was a huge lump of concrete, two meters by I think 750 by 850, massive concrete with a trough one end and a duct the other end, and it goes passes through a palisade fence. So 
on the right hand side is a is a, a design and iteration for, for a way of doing that it may be that you'd only need one of those covers so you could narrow it down a bit especially on the on the road side as opposed to the track side um, but things like that that we're open to and that's a different sized module and a different size chamber things that we can work to in that respect and then again just to give you the confidence in the calculations that we've gone through and all of the checks that we've done into interdisciplinary checks that we've done and we've been on the on the calls throughout with uh, with network rail as well looking at standard um, details making sure that they're fit for purpose um, and put in implementing the designer risk assessments within those as well and looking at the overturn moments uh, and making sure that we've got everything there so I mean, really and truly, the last thing that I was going to touch on that we, we mentioned before was, or I mentioned before even, was about sustainability, about building back better. And, and it falls in line really with uh, the safety, technical and engineering strategic plan. Uh, it's quite clear that their primary goals for future infrastructure uh, need to be focused on safety, network performance, um, cost efficiency, asset sustainability and network growth. Now, I didn't really touch on the cost efficiency of it either, but when we're looking at the uh, the reduction in uh, time to put these in, we're looking at time saved costs uh, on this as well. So if you can imagine over um, 20 of these single ones going in, we're saving 40 shifts really, uh, well, uh, on, a, on a double cabinet base, sorry, when we're looking at, we're, look, we're saving roughly about 40 shifts and that's that's a huge amount of money. There are there about, about 60 grand, depending on what sort of cost models you look at as well. But we're we're trying to, improve the safety by eliminating the manual handling side of it, reducing RSI, pulled muscles, finger crushing, which is one of the, the, the biggest on the on, on the list of issues. Um, trying to make sure that the safe system of works packages and risk assessments are able to go ahead when we're looking at rural installations instead of trying to lug 120 kilos of concrete between three people. Um, cost efficiencies, obviously with the network performance, improving the shift productivity, but also being able to drop a full suite of, of load bases in at the same time if you've got the ability to do so. So we're trying to get more done in a shift, reducing the amount of possessions uh, and drastically reducing the project length and carbon output of that as well. So um, also trying to trying to fit in with the, with the climate change adaption for, for like for better uh, rather than like for like. Trying to consider the whole life cost and the best strategic approach for, for managing the railway as well. Uh, and we're following the guidelines to produce a product that, that really allows for the adaption at the construction and the asset re renewal stage or at either stage to, to provide resilience to climate change and, and we're trying to do so in, in the most cost effective manner. Um, and we, we've taken all of that into account. We, we, we think that we hit some of the, um, uh, the what they call the challenge points or network rails challenge points as well. So line side ones like safe and effective line side inspections, vegetation management, asset management, and uh, implementing energy reduction activities to reduce the, the carbon impact, if you remember the, the, the huge carbon saving between the, the, this and the, the traditional method. So I hope you see the benefits of this. And more importantly, I hope you see the benefits of working together collaboratively, uh, collaboratively to be able to come up with these sorts of ideas. And that's what I'd urge you to do after this is to try and find somebody who's, who's really interested in, in, in improving what they do. And they're, and they're out there and these people exist. And it's, um, if you can get workshops going, that's, that's the way forward. And in doing the workshops, you come up against a huge amount of questions. And we've got a work bank or you know, a bank of these questions all over, um, not just these ones, loads more. And these are the things that really drive it forward. And you want the constructive criticism um, as, as you strive to, to get something that everybody can use. But um, if, you, if you have any questions, I'd, I'd love to fill them. If I can't answer them on the spot, I'll, I'll gladly get back to you as well. Um, but I think you'll, be, you'll be happy to know that that's, that's brought it to an end slightly. So, um, yeah, thank you, for, thank you for listening to that. Um, and I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to come on here. So thank you. Well, thank you for that, George. Uh, very insightful, uh, very polished. Thank you. Um, I, I've uh, I've got a question. Um, if anyone else has got any questions, you can either put them in the chat um, or just uh, unmic yourself and raise them. Uh, I've got an observation first. Um, yep. George, disappointing to see that the drilling machine being used <laughs> wasn't a red hilty one. I Never didn't mind. have any jurisdiction on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. Um, Oh, Joe, can you say, uh, just talk me through that. You mentioned the uh, cabinet doesn't require p uh, product acceptance. Just talk me through that. Okay, yeah. So as it um, falls under the, the remit of being a civils asset, um, it can't be 
approved because it just doesn't there's not um a scope for it to go through the product acceptance route so we went to product acceptance uh to to go through that process and they said no it's a civil asset it just needs to be signed off um via and in, in this case it's going to be form two form three at group four and group five and so that's what we're doing is is, is project projecting it down that route so it would be down to the designer to be able to implement this into their design so if you wanted to use it now you could it's just a case of making sure that it's technically fit for purpose and you know we do your due diligence but um open for designers to to, to put into the design and um we sign off in the form basis so it's i have a look at mine just here I've, i'm still I'm still trying to embed some drawings into the back of mine but yeah so it's um standard detail and um statement of design intent okay and then you mentioned um obviously about um projects that uh, you're targeting yes is, has, has, there, has there been any sort of project trials undertaken that you can confirm maybe locations um so with this one the, the project trial that we did for it because it didn't need to be network rel approved we did it at the training school so we we've got a physical um unit there that we've taken people to as well afterwards looking at some of the larger projects um, so we're looking at Port Talbot West Phase 2 as one of the resigling schemes that we're looking at and also looking um, at some of the Barks Enhance enhancements and a suite of level crossings um, because we can change it. But no, when it comes to installations of these, I've got one down at Swindon at the, at the training school and I've got one at NAL at their headquarters. Um, and this is still still sort of a live live job getting it onto the onto the first major project as such but i'm uh we're, we're looking at detailed design now on, on a couple of them so it won't be long until it's out there sounds good sounds good um does anyone else have any uh questions for george i take it from the silence that your presentation was uh, excellently that's, delivered yeah, that's, george that's what i'll take from that yeah they're probably reading <laughs> the questions on the screen now like um <laughs> oh well if, if uh, anyone does think of anything else don't you reach out to us and we'll pass yes. on the questions uh, to george uh but just um i'd like to give the vote thanks uh, for george today i mean when you look at that system you know it's lighter i mean significantly lighter when you look at that quarter of time of concrete Mm -hmm. uh it's it's quicker it's easier the dare i say it's even vermin proof and um, you know when you look at this you know potential plug and play and you mentioned four days you know down to potentially four hours or shifting you know against two and a half shifts it's certainly uh, uh certainly something worth considering so george thank you very much no, a, a no, very no. uh it's um it's all testament to the to the to the workshopping um with network rail it was Wales and Western, their capital delivery team down in Wales, um, some wonderful people down there, and it wouldn't have happened, and we wouldn't have even got this far without them. So really and truly, it's a testament to the collaboration skills, and that's that's that was the main part of what I wanted to get across today. Is is that's what you need to be out there looking for. Excellent. Well, as I say, thank you on behalf of the Ashford section. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. thank you very much uh, for that, and obviously thank you to everyone else who attended today. And just before I close, a gentle reminder again, our main meeting will be on Tuesday the 11th, uh, virtually starting at 2.30, and we'll have Richard Craddock from Giesmar presenting his uh, paper, Giesmar, a worldwide partner that you may not know about. So, uh, again, again, another good presentation. So, all that remains for me to say is, George, thank you once again. Thank you to everyone else who's attended. Stay safe, and I'll speak to you all soon. Thank you.